Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining this Your Questions Answered session on employing non-UK citizens here and abroad. I'm Sarah Springford and I'm the CEO at Brighton Chamber, and I'm going to be your host. Today's event is part of the From Brighton with Love series, and um, this is an initiative led by Brighton Chamber and supported by the Brighton Hove City Council with our event partner, Brighton Hove Economic Partnership. The aim of these events is to provide Brighton area businesses with expertise that will see them through the EU transition and beyond. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Ian Robinson, partner at Fragerman, immigration attorneys, solicitors and consultants worldwide. So um, Katie is an expert in UK immigration on all things other than asylum policy. Katie can help you with your own immigration status or to get your business to a position where you can sponsor and employ skilled workers from overseas. Ian is a partner and works with Katie on UK immigration. He also manages client accounts that operate almost everywhere else in the world and he or his team could help answer your needs to employ people. So the UK immigration system is now in place and employers are getting to grips with what it means for existing employees and job applications. The aim of this session is to help you understand what is needed for both groups and how you can navigate the process and meet the needs of your business or organisation. So let's get started. So first of all, could I ask you um, to talk about hiring locally and the right to work? Yeah, of course. If we could bring up the slide deck, um, we obviously want to make this as interactive as possible, but we'll be referring to a few slides as we go on. So the first topic is for those so looking to hire individuals from within the UK. Now, we'll talk about in detail about the sponsored routes. So this would be where their visa is tied to the employment that you're giving them. So as part of that, they would have to apply for a visa based upon the employment with you. But it is really important to consider when you're looking to recruit individuals from within the UK, what visa do they currently have and whether you can hire them on that visa or if you need to sponsor them under a work visa. So if we just move to the next slide, we're just going to consider the routes available for those who potentially don't need employer sponsorship. And there are a number of different visas that, that people can have that isn't tied to their employment. And we've listed a few there. So it's also really important to, to consider that if someone does have a visa, do they have the right to work for you? So as an example, someone could have um, various different visas under the points based system one of which is a tier one investor. And I'm not going to talk about the specifics in terms of what this is, but it's more just for your general knowledge if you see these visas when you're looking to recruit them. So as for a few examples, a tier one investor, if someone has this visa, they can work without any restrictions. Technically, the only thing that they can't do is be a professional sports person, but that's probably not relevant for the majority of people. Um, a global talent visa, they can work without any restrictions but they will need to work within the sector of which they've been endorsed. Say, for example, someone has a global talent visa, that means they must have been endorsed by a governing body, for example, Tech Nation, so they have to specifically work for a tech company. Um, so it's important to have these discussions with the individuals that, you, that you're looking to recruit. They may also have an innovator or a startup, but again, they're restricted in terms of who they can work for. Um, and we've also mentioned there the tier one entrepreneur, which has now been closed and replaced by the innovator, but they can potentially, um, they can only work for the company that they've set up or joined. It's important just to be aware that these categories do exist and to always ask questions and ascertain if this gives them the right to work. There are also a number of, uh, of individuals that may look to, um, to, to, be, to work if they are currently in the UK as a student. And it's important to note that they have limited work rights during term time. So they can usually work for up to 20 hours per week if at a degree level and full time during holidays. Now, this obviously will ultimately depend on their specific term and, and holidays prescribed by the university. So again, you'll need to ascertain that before you can employ them. Importantly, they can't fill a permanent role unless they've completed their course. 
and they would have a pending skilled worker visa application. So in this case, you would potentially need to sponsor them unless they have another route that they could pursue. So moving to the next slide. So then just in terms of other visas that, that individuals could have, they could be an intern. Um, Fragment actually has a tier five license for internship and, and they can sponsor interns which are employed um, by various companies. There's also the tier five youth mobility scheme. So this is a two year visa, which you would be able to see on their biometric residence card that they'll be issued with. Um, it's a temporary visa for certain countries, which is listed there. It's a reciprocal arrangement um, and is only for individuals aged between 18 to 30. India has also recently been added to this list and they are eligible to work for a specific period of time until their visa expires. There's also a number of family based visas. Um, so, for example, those who are married or in a, um, a long term relationship with a British citizen and um, a spouse of someone who has permanent residency um, and also EA nationals that we can talk about a little bit later. So for those who have pre status. Someone may also already have permanent residency. So, again, they obviously have the indefinite right to work in the UK. And there's also a UK ancestry route, which is for those who are Commonwealth citizens with grandparents born in the UK. So this is obviously a very brief overview, but it's important just to note there are a number of different visas that someone can have, um, which gives them the right to work. Now, if we just move on to the next slide. So what does this mean and, and who can work for you? So some visas can give someone the continuous right to work in the UK, i.e. it's for an indefinite period, so obviously British citizens. And when you're conducting the right to work, which we'll talk about a bit later in terms of how you do that, especially in light of COVID, um, obviously the British citizen would present either their British passport um, or their citizenship certificate as evidence of their right to work. You also have EEA nationals who have been granted settled status, i.e. permanent residency, and all others who have been granted some form of indefinite leave to remain. Others that we've talked about may have a temporary right to work, i.e. for a specific period of time. And it's obviously important for you as the employer, as part of your obligations, to ensure that you're compliant with the right to work to keep on file when that visa expires and to ensure that you always have evidence that they have a right to work. And that's part of your obligations as the employer. So that's all of the unsponsored routes. Um, it is also obviously possible to hire someone from within the UK um, who has a visa and to switch them to a skilled worker visa, i.e. the sponsored work route. Importantly, you can't do this if they are a visitor in the UK. They would have to leave the UK and make the application from their country of nationality or country where they have the legal right to reside and submit the application from there. If they are in the UK as a visitor, then they are fully entitled um, to, to have interviews, to job interviews, to be recruited, but they must submit the application from outside. If someone is already in the UK and they have either a skilled worker or an intercompany transfer visa, which is the other type of work visa, you can recruit them and they can switch in country. But importantly, if they have a skilled worker or an ICT with another company, they must apply for a new visa in order to work for you. And as I said, that application can be made from within the UK. It's very similar to the application made from outside. But it's impo really important that if someone does have a skilled worker, they have to make a new application in order to work for you. So I'm just going to pause there um, in case anyone has any questions in respect of that. Great. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, the, we've had one question come in, actually. Let me just um, let me just get that one up. Um, I expose the check on right. Um, so um, you might be covering this a bit more later, but what if a European citizen is a director and employee of a limited company? They're effectively working in the UK without really having the right to work in the UK. Yeah, it's a good question. So it's always really important to consider where the person is physically based. 
So say, for example, if they, even from an immigration perspective, if they're in France and they're working in France and they don't have to have immigration rights in the UK, if they, they are physically working in the UK, they must have a visa in order to work. If they're here as a visitor, that's fine, but they must be compliant with the visit rules. Now, technically speaking, if they are employed by a French company, but they're in the UK working remotely, that, um, that's not compliant with the rules. They must have some type of work authorization um, in order to physically be working in the UK. So it's not who they're employed by, it's where they're actually working. Um, and if you have, um, if you have European um, individuals or those who are looking to work, it's always obviously important to check if they've got settled status under the scheme or if you do need to sponsor them. If they've, as I said, if they've entered as a visitor and they're looking to work and they haven't made an application under the EU settlement scheme, they must apply for a work visa, which is obviously extremely different to how it worked 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, another question, what proof evidence should you collect with regards to students and that they are still studying in the UK? It's a good question. So for the purposes of the right to work, you are only required to have a copy of their student visa itself. It, as your employer, you are obligated, you need to find out what their hours are, i.e. what their term time, what their holidays are, in order to make sure that they, how many hours that they're entitled to work. Um, but you're not obligated um, to find out if they're still studying in the UK unless you want to recruit them on a full-time basis with a view to then sponsor them for a skilled worker. Then you would obviously need um, to ensure that they've completed their studies. And you, one of the examples you could have um, is a degree certificate, which obviously proves that they, they've completed their studies and that they can now work full-time, um, obviously with a view to, to switching to a skilled worker visa prior to their, skill, their student visa expiring. Yes, because sometimes there's um sometimes there's a, a, a you you might have a student who's doing a degree and then they go on to a master's and then there's a there's that there's that gap in between, isn't there? And also I noticed on the student visas they'll say um, they're allowed to work twenty hours during term time. Does that mean they're allowed to work full time in holiday time? Exactly, exactly. But that will differ depending on the university that you go to. For example, Oxford may have very different different holidays to Manchester University so you'll need to understand when those holidays happen and when they can work full-time versus 20 hours per week. Okay great. What if an existing employee who has the right to remain work in the UK but who doesn't want to actually reside in the UK anymore whether permanently or temporarily if they want to live in their home country of Spain or Italy but work remotely online? This is probably quite a common situation in Brighton where you have a lot of digital companies with people scattered all over Europe. So um, how does that work? So from a UK immigration perspective that's that's fine but the individual will need to obviously understand the implications that that, that has on their visa. So say for example that they have some type of temporary leave to remain with a view to applying for permanent residency in a few years time. How many times they're outside of the UK, their absences from the UK will have an effect on that permanent residency application. So for most applications, not all of them, but for most they have to spend more than six months in any 12 month period um, in the UK in order to be eligible. They need to be mindful of that. If they are still employed by their UK company in terms of, um, of a skilled worker application, then their obligations on the employer, um, they are expected to be in the UK um, and to be, to be employed in the UK and, and residing in the UK too. I, I would just add as well, this, uh, this is not an area that we would ad advise on, but it's worth remembering to speak to a tax expert about the risk or possibility of permanent establishment uh, and you uh, uh, being on the hook to pay tax in whichever country it is that they are working for you in. Um, not something that I know in detail, but I know it's a risk to, to consider. So are you saying then that, that yes, if, if, if an employer wanted to go back and live in, in, in Spain and continue working, you'd need to look at, at where they would be paying tax? Yeah, and, and whether or not 
the tax liability for the individual, but also for the for the employer too. Uh, but again, that that's about the uh, the limit of my knowledge, and I only know that because several of my team have wanted to work overseas at various points, and we've had to uh, uh, take an informed decision on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next question, there's one more here. Can can Fragerman offer tier five sponsorship for students coming to the UK um, to do internships with companies who aren't clients? Yeah, definitely. So Fragerman is an overarching body, so it acts as kind of like an umbrella sponsor. So we would be able to provide sponsorship for an intern. Um, it, it's Fragerman not acting as a law firm, it's acting as a sponsorship body. So there are specific requirements for the internship. And, and we have a team here that can assist with the initial assessment to ascertain if the internship meets those requirements and if, um, if Fragman can then sponsor them as an intern to come to the UK. Um, but if anyone does have any specific questions, we can of course put you in touch with our, with our tier five team. Excellent, that sounds very exciting. So um, second question, um, could you tell us how to hire non-UK nationals who are living outside of the UK? Yeah, so this kind of ties into the process from within the UK as well. So if it's possible just to get the slides back, it'll be easier just to explain. So as I said before, and this might be a refresher for a few people, there are two sponsored routes. There's the skilled worker route and the intercompany transfer, and we can talk about both. So if we just move to the next slide. So before we talk about that, it's important, and I might be repeating myself for some people, but it's probably important just to clarify the process. In order for a company to sponsor a non-UK national, they must have a sponsor license first. This essentially means that they've applied for permission from the Home Office that they can sponsor non-UK nationals. As I said there, it's a very, can be a very lengthy and involved process. Um, in general, it's a very document heavy application um, and part of it, as it says there, is to establish a compliant process to ensure that the business is able to adhere to, it, to its compliance obligations um, enforced by the Home Office and that the company has key personnel that can be listed on the licence that have a responsibility to oversee the licence and act as a key contact to liaise with the Home Office. So, and I'm just going to speak about this process generally, because I said it can be quite involved. But the first thing obviously to, to do for a company is to check the eligibility of that company. So it has to be an active and, and trading UK company and you have to provide documentary evidence to show that. Um, and we have a sponsor license team here that specialise in these applications. Um, you also have to ensure that the role that you're looking to fulfil, either by the skilled worker visa or the intercompany transfer, will meet the requirements, i.e. that the role in itself is sufficiently skilled enough. And secondly, that that role is, is being paid the minimum salary for the particular role that you're looking to hire in the UK. And that will obviously depend on what visa that, that you're looking to apply for for that individual. You then also, as I said, you need to identify key personnel. So there's one person in the in the company that has to be um, a UK national and they have to be an authorising officer. That's the role. Now, this is a very important role. It means they are all responsible to ensure that the company, as I said, adheres to their compliance obligations. And that person needs to be aware that that is the role that they're fulfilling and with that comes a lot of responsibility. And then secondly, there's the key contact. This could be the same person, but the key contact is the one that will liaise with the Home Office directly. They'll obviously have both have access to the licence um, and they'll need to obviously ensure that the company is making the requisite updates to that licence. Now, just by way of an example, if you're looking to hire a non-UK national, um, as part of the process, you have to ensure that all of the details of that individual are always up to date. So, for example, if the salary was to increase by over 10%, if the job title was to change, if the work address was to change, you have to make sure that that's updated on the licence by submitting a notification within 10 working days. So you obviously need to have the processes internally in place to ensure that you have a system that can notify those changes and then that it can be quickly updated on the sponsor licence system. 
So once you've obviously checked that you're eligible as a company, that the individual you're looking to hire or the role that you're looking to fulfill meets the requirements, you then would prepare, as it says there, um, an online application form. You'd collate the supporting documentation and that's all then submitted to the Home Office. You pay the fee um, and then you submit the documents to the UKVI for consideration. The decision at the moment um, is, is taking quite a long time. It's about four to six weeks. Um, and usually for our clients, it can take anywhere from about two to four weeks to collate all of the documents required. But then once that's been approved, you then can proceed with the sponsorship of the visa application itself. So then just moving on. So once the sponsor license has, has been approved and you can have both a skilled worker limb, so you apply specifically for skilled worker visas and or intercompany transfer visas. And we'll talk about the differences in the next few slides. So if we just move on to the next one. So skilled worker visa. So this um, is essentially a revamp of the tier two general visa for those who are familiar with the system before the 1st of January 2021 when the new immigration system came in. There are a few changes um, which have been welcomed um, by, by a number of employers, including that the RLMT, which is the resident labour market test or the advertising process has been abol abolished and so has the annual cap. This means you're no longer required to advertise a role for 28 days in order to ascertain if there are any suitable set of workers. You don't have to do that. So the process for um, non-EU nationals is obviously a lot quicker than it was pre 1st of um, January 2021. The skill level and the salary um, has been reduced. So the skill level used to be RQF level six, which is a degree level, but now it's RQF level three. Now this means the individual doesn't necessarily have to have the equivalent of A-levels, but it just means the role itself has to be an RQF level three. Now, the way that the Home Office do this is that they have something called SOC codes, which is a way of categorizing um, specific job roles. So as part of the process, if you have a job role that you're looking to, to hire a non-UK national for, you have to see what SOC code that role will fall under. Each SOC code has a minimum salary and it has um, an, a skill level that it's assigned to. And you have to make sure that it, it, it's assigned correctly. Um, so for it, essentially to stop those um, individuals who are looking to potentially um, assign it to a SOC code with a lower minimum salary, it has to be accurate to the best of your ability. Um, as part of this process, you have to score uh, requisite points, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, it can be a little bit complex in terms of trying to ascertain essentially what the minimum salary is because there are now tradable points. Um, there's also a new process. So there's something called the defined certificate of sponsorship. So the way that it works as part of the skilled worker application, you as the employer will prepare um, something called a certificate of sponsorship, which is an online document on the, um, on the sponsor management system, which just details you know, the job title, the job description, the salary, which is then, if you're doing an out of country process, is then submitted to the Home Office where they undertake an initial assessment, they approve it, which will then allow you to assign it to a specific individual. So then you would put the personal details. Once that's been assigned and you've paid the relevant fees, it generates a unique reference number, which the applicant can then pop on their visa application form and submit it and, and provide their biometrics and that starts the visa application process. Um, the only other difference in terms of the tier two general to the skilled worker is you're now required to put the CAYE supply reference number, um, which isn't a significant um, issue, it's just something to be aware of when you start to submit these certificate of sponsorship applications. So then just moving on to the next slide. So these are the tradable points that I was talking about. This looks a little bit complex, <laughs> but we'll break it down. So if you just see it as there's two tests. So as I've said before, this is where an employer needs an overseas worker um, or a non-UK national applying from within the UK. So test one, employed by an approved sponsor. So the company, as I said, has to have a sponsor license. 20 points, relatively easy. 
The role itself has to be skilled, which is what I spoke about before. It has to be at the requisite skill level, RQF level three, and be assigned to the correct SOC code. The individual has to meet the English language requirement. There are various ways to, to do that. Um, you can take a test. Um, if your degree is taught in English, um, you can get the requisite certificates to prove that. Or if an individual is from an English speaking country, um, or now the rules have changed slightly. So if an individual um, study GCSEs or A-levels, you can provide those certificates. So that's 50 points. Now, the, the more confusing part of it can be test two. So this is all about salary. So the first way of doing it, so you essentially you need 20 points because you need 70 in total. So you've got 50 from test one. All you need to do is get 20. If the person is being paid the minimum salary, um, which will depend on the role, but generally speaking, it will be 25,600 or above or the SOC code minimum, they'll get 20 points. Now, if the salary for any reason is going to be lower than that amount, so for example, we've provided there between 23,000 to 25,599, they would get 10 points. So they essentially would need to find 10 points elsewhere to get a total of 20 points. And below there are some tradable points. So say, for example, if the salary was below the minimum um, within that range, which is stated on the slide, but they have a PhD in a relevant subject for the role. For example, if they were a lecturer and they were going to be a lecturer in history and they had a PhD in history, they could trade in those points. So they would then get a top up of the 10 points, 20, 70 in total, they're good to go. If the salary is between 20,480, i.e. the minimum amount up until just over 23,000, technically they score zero points. But in practice, this just means they're eligible to trade in those points. So they would then either have to have a PhD in a STEM subject or the applicant is a new entrant, i.e. they're under the age of 25 or they're in the UK already with a student visa. If the salary falls below the minimum amount, it is not possible for them to trade points. So they would either have to um, they would have to increase their salary or look to a, another type of visa. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to pause there because I appreciate it's quite confusing before I go on to the intercompany transfer route. Yeah, that's great. And then um, questions. Perhaps we've had we've had some questions. Yeah. As well. Okay. So I will just go through those. Um, so a few about the the sponsoring. So I'll ask those together. So. How much time and how much does it typically cost an employer to become an approved sponsor? Is this something a company can do on its own without any specialist consultancy help? It's a really good question. So the government fee itself, depending on the size of the company, will vary from about 350 to 550 pounds. We can clarify the amounts um, specifically. And there also is an optional priority service fee um it it is a complex application um there are um i think easy easy pitfalls for people to not collate the required documentation we are aware obviously of companies that have done this process themselves um from what i understand so we have a specific compliance team at fragman and they've seen recently a number of smaller companies who have tried to do it themselves um, it, it's been refused and they're now looking for, for support. The one thing that I would flag is that if the application is refused, you are prevented from making an application for six months. So this could potentially have quite a significant impact on the business in terms of uh, um, workforce planning. Um, if you then have to delay it by a further six months, you really do want to get it right the first time. Um, so is it, is yeah. it, it's difficult for you to say how much it would cost, I guess, because it, it's, you know, how long is a piece of string, I guess? Yeah, I mean, at Fragman, we offer different service levels, so it's not just one fee. It depends how involved you want us to be or if you want a law firm to be in part of the process. We do offer a very involved service where we would come into the, the organisation and conduct a mock audit. 
because as part of the process, it could the Home Office could decide that in order to assess the application, they want to audit the company where they would come in to check that you have the right protocols in place to be compliant, um, which is a, a big pitfall for some people. It's a big risk. So something that we offer, we would offer mock audits. But um, it's it's I, my advice would be it's certainly some, worth something pursuing or at least speaking with a team to see if you potentially need any help. But like I said, we do offer different service levels depending on, on, on what you would need. Is it is it easier for companies who are doing more than one um, application? You know, do they because they're repeating the information or, or, or is it is it just, you know, if you one is just as. You know, it, you might as well do one or three or ten. So the, the sponsor license is just one application. So that's what you need to get to get the sponsor license. Once that's been approved, then the skilled worker application is is, is relatively um, straightforward. Um, if, if you have the proper processes in, in place. Um, Ian, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, so I would say that the first time that you're sponsoring, assume somewhere between three and five months before the person is on the ground and, and working but it can it can take a little bit longer um after that assume somewhere between four and six weeks per person whom, whom you're sponsoring or all in and and these are the these are assumptions and they will differ depending on where you are where the person is in the world um, the type of application they're making um, how COVID is operating in that particular part of the world and all sorts of stuff. But we we are whoever advises you should be on top of latest trends and so on. And the trends aren't too volatile. Um, the, the sort of trend that gets us really exciting would be boring to any normal person, um, frankly, in terms of timing. The, the cost-wise, cost-wise, uh, UK immigration isn't cheap. So as Katie said, you're looking at somewhere between three or four hundred pounds and maybe five or six hundred pounds for the license in terms of government fees in terms of government fees for the um, the individuals you're sponsoring if i was sponsoring sarah for years as a small as an sme in brighton that would cost in total in government fees um about four thousand pounds in government fees ish i'm not going to do the sums in my head but about four thousand um some of that um, she would be expected to pay, but you can cover the cost. Uh, part of it you have to pay. Um, and, and, you know, we go through that advice or whoever could go through that advice with you, but it's not, it's, it's just not cheap. Um, and then the, the legal fees, if you go with a lawyer, will differ depending on where you go. But if you take the license, we, we have a service for six or 700 quid or a service for 10 grand. 10 grand you're talking about a massive multinational or a company that's got in trouble before you'd, you'd probably be somewhere in between and towards the lower end i'd imagine but this we, we are competitive but obviously we're not the only law firm out there and you'll want to uh, you want to work out who's best for you i feel uncomfortable if this turns into a fragment pitch to be honest um but yeah so anyway i hope that answers the questions yeah thank you very much thank you and um Perhaps if there's if there's a lot of interest in sponsoring, then perhaps we we will need to run another session and get a bit more on that. Um, so a couple just a, a couple of quick questions before we move on. So um, could you just clarify whether all of the visas apply to those living in the UK only, or also for only for those who are working for UK companies whilst living abroad? So from a UK immigration perspective, if they are not present, physically present in the UK, if they're not living here, then they don't need a work visa. If they are residing in the UK, even if they're working for one to two days a month, they still need a visa. If They are physically present in the UK. So that's how you make the distinction, not who you're working for, but where you live. Thank you. And also going back to the, 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 the conversation about the um, the employee who wanted to go back to Spain um, or Italy and work remotely for a while, how long do they need to be in the country in order to not lose their their um, their right to to apply to for, for settled status? So yeah, it, it will depend on what status the EU national has. If they have pre-settled 
status under the EU settlement scheme, they can't spend more than six months outside of the UK in any 12 month period. And that would apply if they were issued with a skilled worker visa. If the EU national um, has settled status under the EU settlement scheme, then they can spend um, up to five years outside of the UK. Um, if they spend more than five continuous years, then they will outside the UK, they will lose their status. If they came in for one day, their five year clock would start again. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated because then if they're issued with permanent residency or indefinite leave to remain under the immigration rules, i.e. if they've had a skilled worker visa, then the, they can only spend up to two years outside of the UK. So there's a various different scenarios. It's important if someone's deciding to make that choice that they or you understand what visa they have, what are the implications if they do want to progress to indefinite leave to remain, um, and, and then just take it from there. Okay. Yeah, there, there, are, there are so many permutations and then you've also got citizenship, but typically you can only have 90 days uh, out of the UK, although it, it differs depending on the circumstances. But your best bet is if you're relocating somebody who has been here, he, um, that they either research or seek advice on how much time they can spend outside of the UK and without losing their status or, or roots of status because it will it's just that complicated and, and then you get into does it matter if I don't know if I, if I fly in or leave at midnight and come back at um, 11 o'clock the next day um, you know does that count all, all the complex stuff like that so it's it's hard yeah and, and Covid on top of things will complicate things more yeah and then a lot of uncertainty about work and uh, discretion will be applied in those sorts of circumstances so yeah yeah, we like to try and make things as as straightforward and practical as we can, but that's one of the areas where it's an individual assessment, really. Okay, one last question before we move on. And um, we talked about this at the last <coughs> session, if you remember, about seasonal agricultural workers. Um, and let me just find the question. Um, and really, I suppose it, it was it was about whether there's an update. Um, and um, mm, Oh, here we are. Um, seasonal ag agricultural workers for harvest time. Is there any news um, after the mess of, of this year? Um, the government are likely to increase the numbers issued and widen the scope for coverage. Have you have you got any news on that? So they, yeah, they, they've widened it to a point for HGV drivers, but only um, only certain HGV drivers and then people working in abattoirs. But it feels slightly it feels slightly haphazard at the moment. It feels like it's been done through gritted teeth. So essentially, essentially on that, what you want to do is avoid sores if you can. And that will mean looking at whether or not people have been here, whether they qualify for um, pre-settled or settled status, and maybe they've got family and, and so on. If you have to go with SOARS, then, then that can work. And you would be looking at whether or not the particular area of um, the particular... I, I was speaking to someone recently who um, farms Christmas trees, and, and they won't qualify. From memory, I don't think they qualify because you can't eat a Christmas tree, um, essentially, or it's not on a list of things that you can eat. So it, it yeah, it just it needs that extra bit of research. The the other on a similar that was a slightly um, um, that was looking at the politics of things. There was a question, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the person's name, about whether the minimum salary for immigration will go up as a consequence of the living wage going up. I think that's very unlikely. Um, really, I I can't see the Home Office increasing it um, anytime soon. Although I should imagine that a year or two into free movement having ended, they'll ask uh, officials or the or their other advisors to tell them whether or not minimum salaries should be higher. Great. Um, do you expect the salary brackets on Test Two eligibility to change with the minimum wage increases? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that. Sorry, I preempted. That was the question I answered a moment ago. No, I okay. don't. I don't. Yeah. And um, so, are we saying that in theory you can employ European-based um, employees and give them UK contracts without them ever coming to the UK? I'm guessing what you're going to say here is that that employment law is going to be complex because um, 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, we would only be able to advise from an immigration perspective. Um, so if, if that was something that you were looking to do, we would advise, as Ian said, to get tax advice and also em employment law advice. From a UK immigration perspective, as I said, if they're not physically present in the UK, they don't require a visa, but there might be employment law implications and there'll certainly be tax as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And um, by the way, if Spain was the example, I know there was a very good Spanish lawyer in the chamber last time we spoke. He, um, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, but I'm sure she would appreciate the shout out and be able to help. Yes, but, okay, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll have a look at that. Um, so final question, what do employers need to do, uh, need to know about compliance? So we have a few slides just on the right to work. I think that was probably um, the main question. Um, I touched upon the other compliance obligations in terms of making notifications to the Home Office. Um, but if we could just get the slides up, um, if that's okay. Um, so then just moving, I mean, I can briefly talk about the intercompany transfer route. That's really only applicable for those who have a company overseas and they're looking to transfer um, individuals um, to the UK. There are different salary requirements, but if anyone has any questions about that visa, then please just ask away in, in the chat box. But I'll, I'll move on to the next few slides in terms of right work now. We just move on to the next one. So I'm going to talk about the process um, that it was pre-COVID and that it what may become next year. Um, just to let you know, obviously, so I'm going to talk about physical right to work checks, online right to work checks, and how this process has temporarily changed in light of COVID. Um, so just in terms of a physical right to work check, this isn't the case now. But the Home Office can reintroduce this. Um, so a physical right to work check is where an employee be required to obtain the original documents. There's two different lists um, and we provided a hyperlink there for you to review. Um, you would need to, as I said, you would need to see the original document. You would then need to undertake various checks on that document. For example, obviously checking that it is the person that they say they are, um, the expiry date to ensure that the, the check is valid. And um, you would then also be required to take a copy of the document, confirm that you've seen the original um, and then retain that, that on file. You would then have a statutory defence against illegal working if for any reason that document, um, there was any issues with the document or the person. So then moving on to the next, the other, the other type of right to work check, which is an online right to work check. If we just move to the next slide, if it's okay. Perfect. So this is a system that the government are slowly trying to introduce. Um, at the moment, it's voluntary. As I said, it can only be used in, in limited circumstances, um, which at the moment is where the individual has a biometric residence permit or they have status under the EU settlement scheme. So you, as, as sorry, the employee would initiate the online right to work check um, through the online service. They would input um, relevant information. A share code would then be generated, which they then share with their employer, who will then go on to the employer validation web page, which will then you give the share code, the individual's date of birth and the company name, and that would then provide essentially confirmation that the individual has the right to work. So just moving on to the next slide. So as I said before, this process is all a bit different at the moment. Um, the government introduced the right to work um, guidance, um, which is uh, valid from the 30th of March of last year at the moment until the 5th of April 2022. You would simply have to ask for a scanned copy or a photo of the original document via email. You would arrange a video call with the employee or the new joiner and ask them to hold up the original document for you to verify against the digital copy of the document. You would record the date you make that check um, and then obviously explain that that is an adjusted check based upon COVID. Um, but you could obviously also, as I said before, you can use the online checking service, um, which, which, is valid, which is valid now, but as I said before, it's, it's voluntary. Um, and then there should just be one final slide. 
Um, yeah, so as it said here, so the Home Office will let employers know in advance when these measures, temporary measures will end. And as I said, after that date, you'll need to follow the checking um, process set out in the right to work check. You won't need to take out, um, carry out retrospective checks on those who have had the adjusted checks during that period. And you will maintain a defence against any civil penalty if the check that you undertaken during was, was done in the prescribed manner as set out in the guidance. And as I said there, the Home Office are at the moment undertaking a review um, to essentially try and find developed technology which is going to support digital right to work checks in the future. And this is all part of their plan to digitalise the entire immigration system. Um, and as, as it says there, it will essentially enable employers to conduct checks more remotely rather than asking people to, to send or see original um, documentation. Great. Okay, there should just be, there might be one final slide. <laughs> okay. So this is the employer checking service. So this is something separate to checking the right to work. So this would be um, most relevant for those who don't actually have an acceptable document on the two lists, as I explained before. So this is applicable for those who potentially have an outstanding application submitted. They don't have the BRP card, um, but they've made a valid application. You can also check um, using either the unique application reference number of their pending application or if they have another document from the government, like a certificate of application, which confirms that the Home Office have their application and it's pending, this will enable you to generate um, a positive verification notice from the Home Office where they can review the application that's pending with them and then provide you with confirmation that they do have the right to work whilst this application is pending. Great, thanks Katie. No problem. Um, and as we've said, we'll be, we'll be sharing Katie's slides um, with everybody. Um, before we um, wrap up and while we see whether there's any last couple of questions, um, Ian, I wondered if we could ask you to give a brief introduction to Talent Beyond Boundaries, because this is another way that um, a business can have international talent in their team, isn't it? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, it is, and I'd, I'd love to. Um, just before I do, I'll let everyone know, we, like I said, we want to make it things as easy as we can for you all. So I, I've put into the chat function a link to a diagnostic tool that we put together for the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development um, just before Christmas. And it, you just uh, ask, answer a bunch of questions about the person, if you've got a candidate in front of you who is not British or Irish and, and is subject to immigration control, answer a bunch of questions and it will tell you whether the likelihood is that they have the right to work and if not, what you need to do. <coughs> I'm always nervous about automating legal advice because you don't know how it's going to be used at the other end. So please, we've got caveats and I even put one in the chat. Um, make sure that you every case is different. It will deal with 99.9%, .9%, but always um, uh, properly check the law or seek advice before using it. So Talent Beyond Boundaries is, so I'm, I'm a trustee of Talent Beyond Boundaries in the UK. We are a global um, charity that matches skilled people who are refugees or forcibly have been forcibly displaced from their home with employers. So the deal is essentially we have a catalogue of over 30,000 um, skilled people, everyone from butchers to accountants, uh, nurses, doctors and so on, all skills um, in the catalogue, which is essentially a LinkedIn for uh, refugees. If you have skills shortages and you are struggling to fill those vacancies locally or find people who can fill them, then the catalogue is, is one more option for you to look at along with Wherever you, wherever you go to recruit at the moment. It, it feels slightly humanitarian and like charity. And, and of course you are, you would be transforming the lives of the people that you would ultimately be sponsoring with a, a skilled worker visa, the visa category that Katie uh, described earlier. But, but actually we, the way we see it is, it, it only works if it makes business sense. So these are good quality uh, candidates. They, they will struggle if you're in a refugee camp in, um, in Jordan or Lebanon, you only get electricity for two hours a day, let alone um, 
Wi-Fi. So they will struggle occasionally with um, interviewing and so on, but we work on the ground with UNHCR and other charities to make that as straightforward as we can for you. Um, and, and also to ensure that the candidates, to help you ensure that the candidates do have the skills that you need. Uh, we recently, most of our focus so far, the charity got to the UK a little over a year ago. We've been doing it in Canada and Australia for years and it, it goes really well, really good quality people. Um, most recently we had um, a, a hospital, a private hospital in London, uh, interview for 16 vacancies and they interviewed 35 candidates of whom they thought actually they're so good uh, we're going to offer jobs to 34 of them and um, the 35th person is that their English isn't quite strong enough at the moment so on the ground telling beyond boundaries with our partners um, in the refugee camps are, are helping that person to improve their English so that he can um, he can be the next and a promise is there so he can be the next person to be sponsored so it is it's really good quality, really good quality uh, employees really. And as much as, as much as I've said, it's not charity and it's not, um, it's not a humanitarian um, visa category or, or move. These are people, if not for the fact that they were forced out of their home by welfare, they are people who would be working in hospitals, who would be management consultants, who would be manufacturers, who would be engineers and so on. It's just circumstances that's pushed them away. So that's my uh, slightly um, slightly clumsy, actually, um, pitch for the organisation. If you are interested, whether it's because you want to help or because actually you need people to fill skills, uh, gaps and roles that you're otherwise struggling to fill, by all means, get in touch with me and I, I can get you pointed in the, in the, in the right direction. The, the only thing I'd add to just to finish off is that after the Afghanistan withdrawal, there was an awful lot of interest in, in, in how employers can help um, asylum seekers here or refugees in and around Afghanistan. Um, this, this is one of those ways. We, we tend to be nationality agnostic. What matters to us is if a person has been displaced from their home. Um, but we have had, we have had an increase in Afghan nationals registering um, since, the, since the withdrawal. So there is that too, but of course, I, I say that as context, not that I, I'm sure that nobody on here would want to help any people only from a particular uh, from a particular country. So I hope that's helpful. If you if you'd like more information, let me know and, and Google and it's a lovely website that, that's really easy to follow. It sounds like a really a really good initiative, and um, yes, we'll share the details after as well. But thank you very much for sharing that, Ian. Um, so it's time to wrap up the last couple of minutes. Um, so big thank you to Ian and Katie. Thank you to Brighton Hope City Council. Um, for those of you who are new to Brighton Chamber, um, we are a not-for-profit independent membership organisation for the aim of helping people run their businesses. Um, and if you found today's session useful, do check out our events calendar. We've got a wide variety of in-person and online events. Katie was saying that they'd love to come down in person next time so and yeah. visit Brighton. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to do that. Um, our next Q&A is on Tuesday and it's actually on the autumn budget, what it means for your money, led by Plus Accounting. It's free to attend. Um, on the 17th of November, we have our big debate on a four day week um, would be good for Brighton. We've got a great panel and again, it's free to attend. And the next in the From Brighton With Love series, we have a bite-sized learning session on the impact of different cultures on exporting and a uh, panel event on global marketing in January. So that's the end of today's session. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email from us shortly, and we look forward to seeing you all again at an event soon. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone.